uh, you know, I, I have, of course, out of necessity, been following the situation for so long and living it. And uh, where I uh, almost despair, and I am at the point of despairing that there will be peace in my lifetime, mm. is that uh, let's take the, the latest uh, incident uh, uh, issue. Mm. And the latest issue is, is this settlement mm. uh, that uh, America and the UK and the whole world wants a freeze of the settlement. Now, freeze of the settlements is not a big deal to, to us mm. because all the settlements at initio are illegal under international. There are not, no two questions about it. They, it. It shouldn't be a freeze, it should be a, 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 a complete dismantlement of all the settlements. How does Israel react? Israel begins to bargain. That's how they, they know. They bargain. They bargain that in return for a freeze for settlement, they want concessions from the other side. Uh, now, you can bargain, and you can be very good at bargaining, and there's no question that the Israelis are excellent at bargaining. And I will give other examples. I was involved in the first year of the negotiations in, in Washington, and I saw how the Israelis bargained. And followed after that the negotiations, I mean only from a distance, because I was not involved, the negotiations in the Oslo. As far as I'm concerned, that time was a time when the possibility for real peace existed. The, the, certainly on the Palestinian side, there was a real interest in achieving peace. And I believe the same happens on the Israeli side. It's difficult to believe that the Israelis do not want peace. Of course, they want peace. Uh, I, I'm not talking about the leaders, I'm talking about ordinary mm -hmm. people. They, they may not want to give up the, 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 the territories they will occupy, but in their heart, they want peace. Anyway, so what happens? Uh, people like their legal advisors, one of them is Joel Zinger, for example, become very, very clever. And lawyers can become very clever. And, and you can spoil your case by being a bit too clever. And uh, I was following the negotiations and, and uh, looking at the role of the lawyers on the Israeli side, because the Palestinian side in the Oslo did not have lawyers at all, which is mm. just terrible. So the Israeli lawyers kept giving advice to their leaders about, oh no, no, this is too dangerous, this should be removed. This. And then at the end, they achieved a piece uh, of paper, an accord, which, which confirmed all the benefits that Israel had, all the arrangements that Israel had managed to put into place in the course of the occupation. They, they confirmed what was there, they confirmed the problem. And then I used to think, oh, this is very clever, they were able to, to get away with it. But when you think of it, and surely later on in history, it's going to be deemed as the greatest disaster. Because these clever people, these excellent bargainers, bargain peace away. Hmm, I see what you mean. But, and, and, and I don't disagree with you, and of course you're a lawyer, and so you're, you're bound to see um, things that way. But, but um, what, what I felt, you know, what moved me very greatly was that the journey that I made you know, and it was such a simple journey. I got on a bus at a bus station in Jerusalem and I got off in Ramallah. Okay, I went through some checkpoints and stuff and coming back was a bit harder. But it's, it's terribly simple. Um, and yet it's a journey that no Israeli can make. Um, I, I could do it as a foreigner, but somebody with an Israeli passport, um, well, they could do it. They, would never, they wouldn't be allowed back. They'd, they'd be questioned and, and interrogated. And of course, also for Raja to do it is very much more difficult. Again, the, the going is easy. The coming back is, is more tricky. Even, you know, even for me, coming back, I had to do the notorious um, checkpoint and you know, um, holding up your ID and so on. But um, one of the reasons why I wanted to write the story that I wrote was because it's not only that we in the West don't know um, what happened and the settlement that happened in 1948 and, and the, you know, the, 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 the things which have gone wrong subsequently and the, the, um, the appropriation of land which still continues, but that people in Israel themselves actually don't know because they're not in a position to find out and that, that young people um, grow up and, and you know, go to school and believe all sorts of things which are simply not true um, because um, as a, a sort of, uh, in, in a way, they're not to be to be blamed for not knowing because they are told something different, and there's a wall there, and they can't cross it, and so they have. You see, I think it is partly um, the problem of perception because because I spoke to the people on the Israeli side, and they're terrified, they're scared, they see this wall, and they believe that beyond this wall is kind of 
you know, chaos and anarchy and it's seething with killers and it's, and people would say to me, but you know, how can you go there? And, you know, weren't you scared? And, Are you still alive? And of course the truth is I got off the bus and I had a bit of paper, I was lost and, and a young girl came up to me and said, oh, I'm going that way, I'll show you. And everything was, you know, it was poor, but it was completely normal. And the, and the, the creation of this sort of terrible underworld beyond the wall is, is partly necessary for, the, for the, I, I guess because I'm looking at psychology for the psychology which then allows um, people to be terrified and um, so that you know so that they go into situations of negotiation being terrified of you know of conceding an inch because you know these people are so dangerous um, well simple that <laughs> I can say is if you've stolen other people's property... Of course they're going to go for you. Uh, yes, I yeah. know, yes. Uh, but, you know, uh, I remember you mentioning that uh, when you said that you were going to parts of Lid, you were on the bus. Yes, bar. absolutely. So, so, so there is fear in the Absolute society, fear. And the which is not well, only related to the Palestinians. No. It's, it's fear, fear of everything. And the funny the thing is, I, was, I ended up... Uh, the, um, in, in my... Um, you know, as you know from the tractor book, I'm Ukrainian and I speak Russian. And one of the things that absolutely astonished me when I got to Tel Aviv is it is absolutely full of Russians. And so suddenly I could go around and speak to people like a native. And there were lots of people who, um, who were Russian, who lived in Lid. So, what, again, I caught the bus from Tel Aviv to Lid. And I ended up, um, at the end, wanting to go to, um, you know, somewhere which is very important in the book, which is St. George's Church. St. George is one of the great saints of the Christian canon. And you would have thought that his birthplace would be kind of, you know, would, would be marked with a, you know, plaque or something. And so um, the bus was going on and on and on. And I assumed, you know, and then I started asking the bus driver, but, you know, where's the church? Where's, you know, where's St. Um, St. George's? I think it's his burial place, actually, not his birthplace. So maybe both. It's the place where he's supposed to have fought the dragon. Um, and people looked at me in absolute astonishment. Nobody had heard of it. And, um, you know, in the end, there was just me and another Russian woman on the bus. And she said, but you're crazy. You know, you're going to that place. It's full of Arabs. They'll kill you. Um, and I said, no, no, I just, you know, I want to find this Christian shrine. It'll, it'll be fine. Um, and in the end, she, she wouldn't, you know, she sort of, very kindly, she thought, you know, she obviously was doing me a favor because it's true that I would never, never have found it. And took me to her house and gave me tea and called a taxi. And in fact, of course, he was an Arab taxi driver who took me to where I wanted to go. And the thing which I found, which I hadn't known, is that the church and the mosque are side by side. If you put your camera lens in the right angle, you can get the, the, the crescent and the cross um, next to each other. And in fact, there's no enmity between them. You know, there's, there's a sort of a harmony and friendship. Um, but, and, and the taxi driver also, you know, thought it was very strange. But people were astonished to see me. And the thing that most astonished me was that I had to really hunt around for this church. You know, um, there was no sign, no plaque. If it hadn't been for the taxi driver, you know, you'd expect to find a national monument with, you know, with a few directions towards it. And, and all there was, all that was left of old Lod was, was piles of stones. Nothing was marked. Nothing was, was sort of treasured or comm commemorated at all. It, 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 was, it was a terrible shock. Um, and I remember that when you came to visit us at the Peak District and we came across a tiny little monument, I don't even remember if it was a monument there, it was all, you know, sort of with its little green National Trust sign and everything. And I think the thing that, 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 that I found that shocked me was this sort of erasing of history. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I mean, I had set out with the intention of writing this, but it came, became all this more urgent that there is a strand of history in this book which people don't know about, not only in the West, but actually Israelis don't know about it either.